in the last few minutes, we've learned much more about the shooting rampage at a Pittsburgh synagogue. Officials in the city have just wrapped up a news conference that we carried live here on CBC News Network. They released the identities of the 11 people who were killed, men and women ranging in age from 54 to 97. The officials also spoke about the police operation to take down the gunman, saying it prevented more bloodshed. Robert Bowers this morning recovering in hospital after surgery for several bullet wounds. As he does, the mayor of Pittsburgh says the city can begin its own healing after what he called its darkest day. Here is some of what officials had to say at that news conference. I want to commend the courageous police officers and SWAT teams who responded to the scene. They are truly heroes who without hesitation, without concern for their own safety, ran toward gunfire to protect innocent victims. By confronting and neutralizing Bowers, they pre prevented additional loss of life. At this point, we have nothing to indicate that Bowers had accomplices, uh, but again, we are in the early stages of this investigation. This was a large, complex crime scene, and much work remains to be done. At present, FBI evidence teams from Baltimore, Washington, and Newark are here to augment Pittsburgh, and we estimate that the crime scene may take up to a week to process. We continue to conduct interviews, scrub social media, review possible surveillance camera video, and exploit digital media to determine how and why Bowers committed this terrible act. Pittsburgh's a strong town. We are a resilient city. Uh, we have been knocked down, and we've found ways to stand back up. And we've always done it in one way. We'll get through this darkest day of Pittsburgh's history by working together. Natasha Fatah joins us now from the breaking news desk. So, Natasha, we both listened into that news conference, the whole thing. We learned many more details. What stood out for you? John, let's talk about the motivation of that horrible attack that took place yesterday. Now, over the course of the past 24 hours, we've been getting some sense of who this man, Robert Bowers, is and what his uh, political or ideological beliefs might be. Much of that is coming from reporting indicating that he posted anti-Semitic beliefs on social media platforms. But now we've got it on the record from those officials that spoke just a while ago saying that, in fact, he made those anti-Semitic remarks directly to them. So we've got a bit of that and we also received an explanation because a lot of people are asking why is this not being treated as an act of domestic terrorism. So let's have a listen to some of that explanation. During the course of his deadly assault on the people of the synagogue, Bowers made statements regarding genocide and his desire to kill Jewish people. The distinction between a hate crime and domestic terrorism is uh, hate crime is where an individual is animated by a hatred or a certain animus toward a person of a uh, certain ethnicity or religious faith, and it, it becomes domestic terrorism where there is an ideology that that person is then also trying to propagate through violence. And so we continue to see where that line is, but for now, uh, at this place in our investigation, we're, we're treating it as a hate crime, charging it as such. Now, that doesn't mean that charges of terrorism may not come in the future as the investigation moves forward. But for the time being, it is being treated as a hate crime. So who were the victims of this alleged hate crime? We now have the names and ages of all of those 11 individuals who died yesterday. And, John, they range in age, as you've mentioned, from 54 to 97. These were the grandparents of this neighborhood. They would have been there providing guidance for the ceremonies that were to come over the course of the day because, of course, this was uh, going to be a day of many, many events taking place within that synagogue. They are still um, managing to deal with all of this. The authorities say that this area will be locked off for about a week. Um, so we cannot imagine how difficult this will be for members of the Jewish community, not only in Pittsburgh, but really right around the world because the sentiment we are hearing again and again is that this is a community that routinely feels targeted anywhere and everywhere you look. Thanks, Natasha. You're welcome. Joining me now for more to follow up on yesterday's Pittsburgh shooting is Rabbi Karen Gorbin. Uh, Rabbi Gorbin, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. We understand that your temple is just a few blocks away from the Tree of Life Synagogue and is open this morning as usual. What was that decision like for you? So one of the things that um, we discussed yesterday was when there is, uh, and frankly, we are going to consider it an act of terrorism against the Jewish community, um, that when there's an act of terrorism, we don't give in to the terror, um, that we continue with 
life as usual and say that we will not let something like this derail us. Um, and the other thing is that uh, Jews come together as a community. And so while there was an opportunity last night and there will be another opportunity tonight for the whole community to come together, this is our synagogue community and this is when we gather. Um, so it makes sense for us to be here this morning. There are children there this morning. Uh, there were children there yesterday, although none of those killed. Their parents and grandparents likely were. What are you telling the children who are under your care today about how to deal with something like this? So we have a, a grief counselor and trauma counselor on site with us this morning, and she worked with our teachers in advance of the, the children coming in about how to respond to kids' questions, mostly by asking them what they know and what they're feeling um, and responding especially to those feelings. Um, we also don't want to be the ones to break this news to our children, um, and we can't guarantee uh, what parents have or have not said. Um, so we're in more of a responsive mode than a telling mode. People are talking about the community where your uh, synagogue is, where the Tree of Life is, uh, and they talk about the, uh, the tradition, how long established your community is. Can you paint us a picture for the people in Canada here about what your community is like and, and how the rest of the community is, is reaching out to them at this time? So the Pittsburgh Jewish community is one that is very interconnected and um, tightly woven together. Um, it's a community that has been around since um, the Industrial Revolution, um, was built on the Industrial Revolution. And unlike many communities in, um, in at least the US, probably Canada as well, um, the Jewish community has remained in the city instead of moving into the suburbs. Um, we certainly have a significant portion of our population who is uh, the Jewish population of Pittsburgh that lives in the suburbs, but we also have at least half that lives in the city itself, and most lives right in Squirrel Hill. Um, so everyone, everyone knows each other. Um, I had neighbors that I hadn't even met yet because I just moved coming to check in on me because they know how close I am to the synagogue, um, to Tree of Life. Um, so, you know, it, that's just, that's the community. Rabbi Gorman, uh, once again, our condolences to the loss uh, and the pain that you're feeling as community, right, your community is feeling right now, and we want to thank you for taking the time to uh, help tell their story to us here in Canada. You're Rabbi welcome. Karen Gor Gorman uh, with the Temple Sinai in Pittsburgh. And the hatred that apparently motivated the attack is a growing problem in America. The Anti-Defamation League, a group that tracks anti-Semitism, says that last year it sharply rose. The group's CEO, Jonathan Greenblatt, spoke this morning on U.S. television. We saw a 57% surge of acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence directed at the Jewish community across the country. It was the single largest spike we have ever seen. And literally, just last week, we released a report, because we also monitor anti-Semitism online. Right. And we've seen a marked uptick in anti-Semitic harassment of political figures and other individuals simply based on their faith. So we are living in a moment where anti-Semitism is almost becoming normalized, and that should shock and move all of us to act. I would expect leaders to lead. We would hope and we should all demand that those in elected office won't just you know, give platitudes after the fact, but they will help ratchet back the rhetoric right now. And they will, you know, if the white supremacists are saying and celebrating what you're doing, that should be a problem for all of us. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau posted a statement on Twitter responding to the shooting. He writes, Canadian hearts are with the Jewish community in Pittsburgh today as they endured a horrific anti-Semitic attack while at prayer. May the families of those murdered be comforted and may the injured recover quickly and fully. The latest crime data from Statistics Canada collected in 2016 points to a 24% rise in police reported hate crimes against Jewish people. It also found that the Jewish community representing 1% of Canada's population was the group most frequently targeted by hate crimes in this country.